So I do think you have to have a level of atypicalness about you. But, you know, motivating salespeople is challenging in some regards because they are, use that word, eclectic. They are a bunch of, of licorice all sorts. This is not a government type environment or you're dealing with the personality types of similar doctors or similar lawyers. We have a very, very diverse array. So that creates challenge, but it also creates your opportunity because if you can get people to notice your messaging, then that gives you an edge in market. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. With thanks to our partner, Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking, and strategies to elevate your results. For more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier for your clients, visit connectnow.com.au. And to get new episodes of Elevate directly to your inbox, sign up at eliteagent.com slash subscribe. Well, hello, it's Steve Carroll here on the podcast. Now, you were probably expecting a female Australian voice. What you've got is a male pommy voice. That's because Samantha McLean has taken a well-deserved holiday after Elite Retreat, and I'm sitting in her hot seat. And in the Elite Agent podcast studio here in the Gold Coast, and I'm delighted that I've got an extraordinary leader to be my guest, Paul Curtin from Place. And before I introduce Paul, it's a quick story. So when I landed in Australia in 2006 working for the Courier Mail, Paul was in fact one of the very, very first leaders I ever had coffee with, along with Damien Hackett. I remember the meeting very clearly. And Paul, I think you had about four offices then. Place has now got close to 20 offices. There is no doubt that as a leader, you have taken place to what is now one of the most significant brands in Australia, certainly in Queensland. And it's absolutely awesome to have you on this podcast today, Paul Curtin. Thanks, Steve, for that warm introduction. Good to be in your company. It doesn't feel like we've broken bread for some time. So we'll have to do that at this podcast, but good to be on today. Yeah, absolutely. I remember once taking you down to Melbourne to watch a footy game and I introduce you to Guinness. And I said, how's the Guinness, Paul? And you said, it's like having Sunday dinner in a pint. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. I do. And particularly when you felt like you'd had enough for the weekend then to be faced with the Guinness at the end, that's an education. You've got to get used to that. Yeah. So Paul, I tell you what, since we met in 2006, the world has changed. We were having a quick conversation offline back in 2006 only four offices, but you would have had pages and pages and pages of ads in the Courier Mail. And today it's all digital. I mean, it's changed so rapidly, but you remember the good old days of newspapers? I do. And I mean, they're still, I mean, look, I mean, I had this conversation with someone the other day who used to work for a a print publication. I think it was called Homes or something of the like. It was probably in competition with the Courier Mail or the satellite papers during the midweek. And that gentleman famously made the comment that this digital thing won't work and print will never die. And I can see you've got some questions for me later that circumnavigate predicting the future. I still think that the nice thing about tradition, and we perhaps see that even in the fact that people still go to the movie cinemas, yet they stream more than they've ever streamed. And there is still that charm of picking up a Saturday paper picking up the print component of it and enjoying some breakfast or enjoying some, I guess, communion with friends or family. So look, it's got a very different use. I mean, if you looked at the average price of the homes in the Brisbane publication or the Courier Mail, it would probably sit $3 million plus and potentially growing quickly to $5 million plus. So how we use it is very different. And obviously you get more bang for buck than you ever did today, but it's not dead. And look, in some ways you could see how it could live on forever but it will have a niche market compared to what the digital landscape is going to do. Yeah, absolutely. No, well put. So, Paul, everybody I think in Queensland knows who you are, but not everybody listening to this podcast probably knows who Paul Curtin is. So I'm uh, just going to do a bit of an introduction in a different sort of way, just ask you a couple of questions. I checked out your Facebook and Instagram profile photos. What's the story behind those two pictures, Paul? Well, I think the first one is actually me calling an auction and perhaps, you know, one of the questions that I least like getting is someone says to me, 
do I still sell? Now, in the true sense of do I put my name on signs, do I go to open homes? And as a general rule, the answer is no. On occasion, I do do that through client sort of requests. But I do believe that if you own a real estate business, you need to remain in, you need to remain transactional. So I still do call auctions. I still very much help people list property, escalate uh, or become that point of escalation, help in negotiations, help on the floor, all of those things. So still very technical. And I do believe that the leader needs to stay at least with the pace of their people, if not in front of it, preferably. And that's always a goal of mine. So that's what the first image would project is that I am hands-on with my people. And then the extension of that, I guess, is our team or one of our bigger offices winning number one office within our group at the awards. And if you go through all of my Instagram or Facebook photos, you'll see very little about me and you'll see absolutely everything about uplifting the team or uplifting our people so that we're giving them, I guess, that projection and certainly celebrating their successes as opposed to growing my profile through success. Now, as an extension of that, I guess you give yourself profile and hopefully people look at you and say, well, that's the sort of environment or the sort of person I'd like to work for, but it's team first. Yeah, excellent. I like that. And look, if Place had a playlist on Spotify, and I have great admiration for the group and what you stand for, but if Place had a playlist on Spotify, what would be the opening track and why would it be the opening track? This takes me back to probably about 2006 when we first met Steve and Damien Hacker, who is my business partner and the CEO of Place, came in with a headband on and uh, had the, wouldn't have been Sonos back then, but had some form of audio blasting and the song was Generator. And as I recall it, I'm a generator by the Foo Fighters. I think in a way, the message we were trying to get through to our team today is, you know, hit the phones, we prospect, we generate, this is what we do to get ahead in real estate. And I think that's a pretty good opening song for what Place has done through its journey. Yeah, absolutely. And if I was to ask your wife the same question, but not about place, but about you, so a playlist for Paul Curtin, what would your wife say would be the opening track or maybe the kids? What would they say would be the opening track? Well, they'd probably be embarrassed to say what my opening track is because it would probably be something along the lines of Mariah Carey, Celine Dion, Whitney Houston. So I'm a bit of a – my playlist, Steve, I have – I use – a streaming service called Deezer because it was one that I got on new many years ago. And one of the reasons I don't go to Spotify is because I've got 1,300 favourite songs that each time a song comes on that I like, you know, and it intuitively obviously works out music. So I have a very eclectic taste in music, whether it is classical, whether it is female, whether it is male crone and some of the old favourites like your Elvises, Roy Orbison, and then there is some heavy metal and all sorts of things thrown in there. But, you know, I probably find that this job comes with a level of that energy and atmosphere and we're up and about. So when I get in my car on my own, I tend to like something that's a bit slower just to give me that balance. Yeah, no, good stuff. And hey, look, what's a quirky or unconventional habit you have that has contributed to your success? Because there's no doubt that you're an incredibly successful leader very likable leader, all the people at place that I know, and I know lots have great things to say about you. But I'm just looking for something a little bit different here, a quirky or unconventional habit that you have. Yeah, look, I've never enjoyed the rinse and repeat of perhaps the way the industry always was. So you know, sales meetings were always on Tuesday mornings at 8.30, why sales meetings on Tuesday at 30, because that's what everybody did in the past. So I do think you have to have a level of atypicalness about you. But you know, motivating salespeople is challenging in some regards because they are, use that word eclectic, they are a bunch of, of licorice all sorts. This is not a government type environment or where you're dealing with the personality types of similar doctors or similar lawyers. We have a very, very diverse array. So that creates challenge, but it also creates your opportunity because if you can get people to notice your messaging, then that gives you an edge in market. So I've tried to communicate the tradition of what we do, like one-on-ones or team meetings or our different internal programs with some atmosphere that's been very much part of my creativity. Now, creativity is probably my God-given gift, so I'm blessed with that. But if you're going to have that, you need to use it. And you know, look, little few examples could be that 
And I don't have one-on-ones anymore. I have speed dates and I put them into <laughs> the agent's diaries for anywhere between eight minutes and 13 minutes. So it would never be a half an hour or 45. It would have an odd time about it. So, and we set a clock out in the front and literally have it counting down. Now, the benefit of that is, is the agents turn up. And the benefit of that is for me, they only go for eight minutes. And rather than speaking for a half an hour about everything else than you really need to talk to, you get to the nut and bolt of for eight minutes. You know, other examples would be that if I was having a coffee with somebody, I'd say, hey, do you want to catch up for a coffee? I can meet you at 9.43 this morning. So again, you sit, send out a slightly different time just to get their attention. I've always been big with acronyms in the way that we describe a lot of our meetings. So one that's really worked well in our business over the past two years is SHIFT. And SHIFT is an acronym for success happens if failure teaches. And the whole idea is when you come to a shift meeting is that we're sharing our wins and our losses, but we're comfortable talking about our losses as well because we're going to learn from that and we're going to shift in the right direction because success is happening if failure teaches. My current bit of fun at the moment is that everything within place, we have remapped to start with the. So our whole performance environment, and we have a document called Sol that sits inside that, everything starts with the. So Josh Vegan is our head trainer. We call him the coach. Our big four auction days, they're called the day. The autumn day, the spring day, the summer day, the winter day. Our kickstart event, everybody started using kickstart, so we call it the climb, which is climbing up and I could go on and on. So it's communicating things that maybe others are rip off and duplicating. But if I see that occur, I don't get disappointed by that. I say, okay, this is my opportunity to come up with something new. And then, of course, you can evolve the product at the same time and get your people on the wavelength. Yeah, great stuff. No, I really like that, Paul. And Paul, I'm on a bit of a high because I've just come back from a conference up in Hayman Island, which I was facilitating and emceeing, 200 leaders, elite retreat. And the theme was genius moves. So it was about the genius moves that people or businesses have made in real estate, outside of real estate that have led to success. And Looking at your LinkedIn profile and just knowing you as a guy, you've been incredibly successful. But when you reflect on all of those years, Paul, what was one genius move that you made that professionally or personally that you're very, very proud of and you'll tell the kids, you'll tell the grandkids when they come, genius move that stands out? Well, genius is a strong word and I don't know whether you can use that adjective to describe what we've done. When you really think about what geniuses do, when you think about the invention of the iPhone or going right back to electricity, lights, telephones. So I'm not sure, but maybe inside our real estate bubble that we all get uh, caught in, if you could say moves that have helped us go in the right direction. I mean, it is difficult to say one thing. If I could use two words, and yours and my relationship relates to this, it's early adoption. And I think that a lot of people get presented opportunities in life, whether it's in real estate or whatever they may do, and probably through fear, maybe through having a lack of mentorship around them, a lack of leadership, they don't bite off. Now, let's use a really good example about realestate.com. Now, I can't remember being ever offered realestate.com shares. I mean, whether they, I think they floated at a dollar and they're at 140 odd dollars today, but we certainly all wish we had the opportunity to buy realestate.com shares on day one. Now, you can't take every opportunity that presents itself. But when I think about inside our business, I guess if I go back to when I was a 21-year-old young agent, I'd only been in the business for two years, and Damien offered me to buy a percentage of his business, which meant loaning real money or putting real money to him, would have been very easy to say no. But there was an early adoption that I felt that would be on the right track. Uh, when I think about the creation of our place brand, where Dave and Sarah and I sat around and looked at some options and we came up with that creativity, would have been very easy to not run with that. We put it in and we adopted. I think about our journey when we, you came to me with uh, not even Premiere, Highlight, Highlight All. And I said, is anybody else doing this, Steve? And he said, no one is. I said, right, let's do it. Let's be the early adopter. The same thing happened with Premiere and other products that we've done along the way. I think about our current head office in James Street, which is a real centerpiece and has really helped us grow and demonstrate who we are. We signed off on that decision in the middle of COVID and it would have been very easy to go, no, this isn't the right timing. And I could give you lots of other examples. And there's also been lots of fails in that. So not everything has worked. 
But look, that would be the better way to answer it is rather than picking on one thing and saying that's been and the reason for our success, that would be too micro. I do feel early adoption and perhaps a better word that we use internally, my weekly management meeting is my execution meeting. I think we've been a business and personally people that execute and that's helped us move in the right direction. Yeah, no, I like that, Paul. And we'll talk about genius moves that were missed or failures that you learned from in one second. But I'll tell you a genius move I saw from, well, a couple I saw from players. One was that domination of the Courier Mail. When I was working at the Courier Mail before I went to REA, because to anybody that was looking, the two biggest brands in Queensland were Ray White and Place. And you were neck and neck. And that was a genius move to keep driving that through. But the other one is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that you or certainly a few people from Place went to visit Foxton's in London to have a look at some of the things they were doing. And I might be wrong, but I think that the minis, the Place minis were an idea that you plagiarized from Foxton's in London. W- would that be right? Absolutely, 100% correct. And we had not long, you could come, call it, come up with the Place brand. And the Place brand creativity there was no ripoff and duplication for anything else there. That was our creativity. But Damien is an amazing entrepreneur. And again, I go back to early adoption. I'm 21 and Damien's, call it 30. So you get you surround yourself with good people, particularly people who've been doing it longer. And of course, you grow together. And you know, Damien, through myself and Sarah, and a gentleman that was close to Damien, had been very successful in a publicly listed business. And we flew over to London, met with Peter Rowlings, who was the Foxton CEO at the time. Damien took him a bottle of Grange to thank him. He looked at that and said, what's this? And he said, well, it's actually not a bad bottle of plonk back in Australia. And we picked up so much. And we brought back a whole host of things from Foxton's. And one of them was the mini. Most of what we brought back was strategy implementation. And the interesting thing with that is that I would say 90% of what we implemented from Foxton's failed. But what it did is, again, it put us on that shift of success happens if failure teaches, whilst we weren't using that acronym back there. But one of the principles that we took from Foxton's was full service to the agents. And if you give full service to the agents, in theory, they should be able to go out there and give a higher level of service to the customer. And this is in an era where Brisbane real estate was pretty basic. It was pretty black and white, it was pretty analog, pretty pre-internet. So even though what we implemented had a lot of, had more failure than success, the principle of providing first-class services to the agents so that they could provide first-class services to their customers, that is still a guiding principle today. We do it very differently because we've learned, but how our whole business model is, is all about providing amazing support to our business owners and to our agents. Yeah, no, awesome. I was actually with Guy Gittins, who's the new CEO at Foxton's with some Australians about six or seven weeks ago. And what a great organization. And it was someone in Foxton's who reminded me of that time that you and Sarah and Damien went years and years ago. So how about that? Let's just talk quickly about failure or setbacks. Can you give me an example of a failure or setback in your career that when you look back, you go, geez, I'm glad that happened. That was an absolute blessing in disguise. Can you share that with us, Paul? That's probably easier to talk about in a way. I mean, and again, I love sharing our failures because there's a humility to that. And it also gives people great confidence that if they have, if things aren't panning out the way they thought on day one or they've checked out, there is a second coming for most of us. And I mean, I often think that we were talking about the footy before we came into it. And most football clubs that win the grand final typically went close the year before. It doesn't always happen that way, but the old saying, you've got to lose one to win one, you know, plays pretty true in sport because you just don't know what you don't know and you get that grease and you get that muscle memory or mind memory. Um, Look, when we came back from, you know, it really you go back to those early days and we had one business in Belimba in Brisbane that the three of us worked in well with the staff. It was thriving. We were number one in market and we got too ambitious. We went and opened two brand new offices, one on the north, one on the sort of, uh, in a west, and within 18 months, one of those offices had closed. So the market went into challenge. We had some challenges inside our partnership through real health of Damien's partner or wife. So there a lot of things happened at once, and it would have been very easy for us to sort of say, 
it's all too hard. I think one of the best stories in that, Steve, was that as we were spending a lot more money than we were making, it was almost lights out. The bank was on our backside. We decided on the launch of one of our offices at Ascot to give away a mini, and we did. The idea was you had to list your property with us in Ascot. It was a $30,000 mini in the day. We went down to the dealership. We drew it out. The people who won it were very excited. I remember drawing it out. I was feeling sick about the fact that we were giving away a $30,000 mini when we were struggling to pay the bills, but we were sort of committed to it. And the people that won the mini had their house under contract with us. Subsequently, the contract fell over a week later. They withdrew their property from us and went and sold it through somebody else. So you know, that was one of those things where when you were down, you also copped a kick in the chin. But again, we bit in and we did what we needed to do. And here we are today. Yeah, excellent. So, Paul, when I was at the REA group, we would often sit around the boardroom table with Tracy Fellows or Greg Ellis, and we'd talk about the leaders that we really admired. And you and Damien always came up, and one of the attributes was the fact that you were very forward-thinking. You know, things happened because you went there as opposed to things just happened to you. So I just want to ask you about the Olympic Games and without giving away the crown jewels of information, I'm pretty sure that around the boardroom table at place, you're talking about the opportunities that will come with the Olympics in Brisbane. Yeah, I mean, incredible. What can you share with us on that? Well, it's a good question. And I mean, you might be surprised with the answer that we actually spend very, very little time talking about the Olympics in isolation and that any of our strategy around Greater Brisbane is related to the Olympics in isolation. I would actually say to you that our strategy of where we want to be, ironically, by 2032, so we sort of had a 2032 strategy before it was even announced that the Olympics were there. The strategy would be fundamentally the same whether that was occurring or not. And the reason for that is is because Brisbane... Certainly, Steve, in your time, you've noticed Brisbane going from a place where to get relatives and friends to come out for any other reason to see you might have been, well, okay, we'll come out to spend time with the Carols and can we go to Noosa or the Gold Coast or get on a plane to Sydney and Melbourne? I'm quite amazed sometimes when I go down to or when I go to our head office, which is in that Jane Street precinct, which I do mention that to a lot of interstate people now and I just wait for a reaction to see whether they go, oh, yes, I know where that is or tell me where that is. And what I can say now is the household name of James Street, when you talk to someone from Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, they know what you're talking about. And because uh, there's a couple of beautiful hotels there with all the restaurants and all the palaver, I noticed that on occasion I'll bump into a real estate agent from Melbourne or Sydney with their family and I'll say, what are you doing here? And they say, we've come up to Brisbane for a weekend holiday getaway. And that's so significant in what's going on. So we have this really lovely place to live on the river, you know, nice housing, relatively affordable, all of those things, great coast, blah, blah, blah. So the trend was occurring. I've got no doubt that once, look, we're in a funny little period at the moment, as I'm sure you're reading, where it's a given that we're going to have a change of government in October. The election is on the 26th. You can see that politically the country is, I guess, going from the left way of thinking back to the centre-right way of thinking. I won't say whether that's a good or a bad thing, but we can see that's happening. You saw what happened up in the Northern Territory on the weekend. So once that change of government is established, hopefully that review of what's occurring with the Olympics and the whole stadium situation, they'll come up with a, an outcome that Brisbane people can feel proud of and that we're going to have a legacy. I am certainly, we're all concerned about the current decisions on, you know, upgrading the stadium out at Mount Cravat or Nathan. So we hope that that's just political posturing by the current, the incumbency and then the change will bring that through. Once that gets cadence, I think that if the marketplace likes what the government will implement finally on the stadiums, I have no doubt that what we are going to see, look, I think it's going to run in parallel with where the interest rate market corrects itself. So 2025 to 2027, I think, is where we're going to find out where interest rates are going to live. So if they're considered at their high point, come 2027, if they end up being about where they're going to hang for a period of time, the fact that then there's going to be hyper-construction going on in Brisbane 
and we're building towards the Olympics, it's hard to see that that won't put an icing on the cake. I think one thing we're all going to have to do as business owners in Brisbane or Queensland is we're all going to have to have a really good look at ourselves in the year leading up to the Olympics to make some good decisions about what a period after that could look like. Because history tells us after the Olympics, no matter how prosperous it was heading in, is that in fact it can go through that natural attrition of a decline. It may not go into recession, but it might go into a period where things are balanced out from all the prosperity leading in. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good answer. Well, can I just ask you about your 2032 strategy? So let's just fast forward to 2032. Let's say that you, Damien, Sarah, the rest of the team are looking at each other, really happy. Everything has gone swimmingly well. All the boxes that you wanted to tick have been ticked. What decisions do you have to make today for that to happen in 2032? I think that's the thing with growth. And I mean, we've got four core values, excellence, respect, innovation, and community. And our purpose is for people to find their happy place. And so if you look at our 2032 strategy, it's all about being the preferred choice for real estate in Greater Brisbane. So where people want to find their happy place, be it through employment or through being a purchaser, seller, buyer, or tenant landlord environment. And we get people offering us distraction from that, as you can appreciate frequently. It might not be daily, but it might be weekly. I open an office in Cairns, I open an office in Townsville, I open an office in Timbuktu. And so once you defer from your strategy of where you can really make sure those four core values and that purpose and ultimately then our mission that attaches to that and the strategies and the tactics that underpin it, once you sort of get carried away and you move away from that and quite often ego becomes a part of that, then what it will do is it will put pressure on that greater Brisbane conversation. What it looks like for us, Steve, when we get to 2032 is not only at the moment we operate in 69 of the 108 sort of greater Brisbane suburbs. So by 2032, we will operate. We sell in more than the 69, but in the sense of the ones where we analyze our market share. So by 2032, for all intents and purposes, we will be in all 108 of those. And quite simply, for us, what that will look like as part of that strategy is to either be the premier or very close to the premier business and or market share in that. And that allows us to have that appropriate voice. I think when you look at a lot of our competition, it's not a criticism. Everyone's got a different model and having an office can be two very, very different things. So we're very clear that the strategy is that when we go to a location or we go to a market, it's there so that we can have maximum impact. Yeah, good. No, good stuff, Paul. So two or three further questions and then we're about done. It's great talking to you, Paul. I've always felt this since I first had coffee with you in 2006. Your passion and enthusiasm about leadership and about the industry is very, very contagious. So thank you for that. If you could collaborate, so you've got this plan of where you want to be in 2032. If you could collaborate with any figure, Uh, any individual, alive or dead, probably outside of the real estate, just to have a chat about where you're going and where you want to get to in 2032. Who would be that person and why? Yeah, I've thought about this. So there's a lot of different ways I could go for it. And, you know, look, the guy I'm going to pick is I'm going to pick Kevin Sheedy. And Kevin Sheedy is one of the most successful AFL, VFL coaches of all time. And he is somebody that I guess in his time, and I'm an S, I was born in Essendon in Victoria, and I'm an Essendon supporter. And I guess I've loved watching what Kevin Cheadle did both for the Essendon Football Club, but in parallel, what he did for the game of Australian rules football. And, you know, so many of his great grand ideas, so much of his vision, not only did it create success for the Essendon Football Club, not only was it part of the professionalism of, of our game, where it went from being largely an amateur sport to professional sport. It went from being the VFL to the AFL. He's worked with, I guess, the Indigenous part of the game. So so much of what he did, opening new clubs like the GWS Giants, who could go on and win this year's grand final. So to sit with a guy like Kevin Sheedy and 
then say, righto, Kevin, you had the game of Australian rules football. We've got this thing called real estate. This is how we do it today. Let's get into the whiteboard. Let's get the butcher's paper out and let's look, I guess, left of centre and let's get creative. And I probably feel that you know, he's a creative genius in the AFL sense. I've got the creativity gene. He'd be a good guy to uh, have some fun with. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, no, good one. And am I right in saying that you once sat on the board of the REIQ? I did, yeah, just for about eight years or so, yeah. Yeah, I've got a pretty good memory. I don't know where that came from. But if you could rewrite the rule book for the Australian real estate industry, what's one rule you would change or eliminate entirely? One of the good things about the real estate industry is that we are largely deregulated. So I think that, you know, know, I feel quite sorry for the financial planning environment. We've been involved in owning a home loans business with partners which had a financial planning arm, which when I looked at the restructuring of that back in the sort of 2016 to 18 period through all that banking, Royal Commission era, et cetera, you wouldn't do that job for all the tea in China. Now, maybe for those that have survived that and that got rid of some of the charlatans, they know what they're doing and they can do it very well and good luck to them. So I do think that is one great thing about the real estate industry is that it is deregulated. One of the big questions that's often put to me is, should it be more regulated to get into it? So should it be degree qualified or things like that? I think there's a really compelling argument for both. But I would say this, when I look at the real estate industry and when I look at some of the thought leaders in our business, when I look at some of the amazing success stories and people's lives who have changed, if there was a much higher barrier to entry, i.e. you did have to have degree qual. a lot of those people probably would not have ended up as real estate agents and therefore that would be a great shame. So I would be on the court of not too much needs to change. And Steve, I probably feel today that there's nothing that stops me from being creative, from being a little bit different, from being a little more energetic from being a little bit more committed, from working harder, and all of those fundamentals that regardless of what industry we are in, that if we can have that self-awareness and we can have that execution on on an annual basis, doesn't mean we have to work 365 days a year, 24-7 type of stuff, but if on an annual basis, we can be really clear on what our mission is, the strategy and the micro tactics, then I don't think there's really anything in the industry that negates that. I see debates on should there be pitch prices on auctions or no prices? And it's done differently in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. And when I see some of my peers getting sort of a bit almost uproared in that, I think, don't worry about it. Just deal with what we've got. Because if I had to have price guides on my auctions, we would list and sell just as many versus not having it. And I think in my time on the board, I did give my, I guess, insight into what I thought was the best way forward. But that was because purely I was on the board at the time. And as I stepped away from that, as I felt like I'd done my time, I thought, well, that's for others now to adjudicate. And if there is change that comes through from other people that are giving their time, whether I agree with it or not, I know that it's not going to be draconian. I know that it's not going to stop me running my business. So that may not answer your question, but I think in many ways, we are so fortunate to have an industry that is very unregulated. And it allows us to go out there and be successful. Yeah, great. So, Paul, finally, what's a common piece of advice in the real estate industry that you often hear, either at events, conferences, on social media, that you completely disagree with? You don't need to name any names, but something that you listen to, you go, that's bull. I don't want to hear that. It's not helpful, useful. What would that be? Well, that auctions don't work. That's the, probably the one that I most don't like. I mean, I do. I listen to, I watch things on Instagram, Facebook, and different spruikers, and you know, there are some big personalities out there. But you know what's interesting with that? I'm happy to use. I'll use Tommy Panos as a good example. You know, Tom's a friend in the industry and has a certain style. I would say that 80 percent of what Tom says, I think, is absolutely fantastic. of what Tom says, I go, that doesn't work for me. I don't totally agree. But I'm not going to pick up the phone and ring Tom or put in the comments that was that because I'm not necessarily right either. And I think, you know, industry needs people that can be outspoken and, and, and can have a voice. And 
I think that that's a, a really, really good thing. Uh, you have other coaches, if you like, that don't do that. They stay very private within the conversation and maybe with their clients and they're trying not to offend them. What I do see sometimes at conferences, and we can be guilty of it too, is that potentially we put people up on stage that aren't ready to go up on stage and or maybe aren't given enough time to get a message across. And so after you put the brochure of that person up there, sometimes you can actually create a level of humiliation for them because they're not given an appropriate amount of time or they're not asked enough questions. And sometimes they can say some things that makes them look like they're not sort of parallel with the success that they've had. So I'm not that controversial when it's all said and done, Steve, and I like listening to all sorts of different people. And again, if I go to a conference or be it sales orientated or leadership orientated, I think you've just got to go with that attitude. If I can take out things that really relate to me, I'm going to enjoy that, respect it. And if the same speaker then says some things that aren't as meaningful, appreciate their energy and effort and time and just don't put that on your notes. Yeah, exactly. A move on. Hey, Paul, just to finish off with, I've got a Facebook memory from many, many years ago of you and I, at the MCG, watching the British Lions versus the Wallabies. So that is 11 years ago because I think the British Lions are back next year. You were draped in all your yellow. I was draped in all my red. And actually, that was a game the Wallabies won, although the Lions won the series 2-1. You're obviously still into your union. Predictions for how the Wallabies are going to go over the next couple of years because they've done it tough. What do you think? Well, I will pick you up on one thing there, Steve. That game was actually at Marble Stadium and not the MCG that night. Okay. So there's my memory coming through. And you were always very generous with those invites. Look, I do follow the rugby union. I mean, obviously, my AFL is my passion, but growing up largely in Queensland and going to a rugby school, and then even having my son in grade 12 and enjoying the GPS season at the moment, now we're all disappointed with where the Wallabies have got to. I mean, fundamentally, the issue with Australian rugby is money. So I watched uh, Les Kiss um, actually speak at the Gregory Terrace rugby lunch on Friday, just gone. And uh, Leeds Kiss is the rugby league player that went on to learn his craft through South African rugby and is now back coaching the Reds, which is a really positive thing. Like South African rugby has money. Irish rugby, where he's most recently come from, is absolutely abundant. And Australian rugby has made all the poor choices since the 2003 World Cup. That is going to be Australia's rugby's challenge moving forward. The other huge challenge for rugby is the fact that it's got the NRL and the AFL. So if either of those two things didn't exist in Australia, we would be a powerhouse. So it's playing a third pawn. That said, if you can see that the rusted on love for the Wallabies is there, and you know we had 55,000 at Suncorp Stadium three weeks ago, even though we got shown we're ranked number eight and the South Africans are ranked number one, and you can see that. But I think they're making all the right decisions with a younger side, building towards the British and Irish Lions too. I think that will be a challenging tour from them, but hopefully that's the tour that gets them ready for the World Cup and they get their squad right. And one great thing about the Wallabies is that maybe not in so many in the recent years, but perhaps with this new squad, if they went into the World Cup ranked third or fourth, they could create an upset. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe you, Damo, and myself can have a reunion next year, 12 years since we did it last. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. I've followed the place journey since 2006. I have only admiration with what you as a company do, what you stand for. I reached out to Amy and your team today and asked her if she'd give me a bit of a helping hand with promoting the bike rides for next year. Within five minutes, she'd replied and said, whatever we can do, we'll do. And that's place written all over. So, Paul Curtin, thank you so much today, and I'll see you around. Steve Carroll, good to be in your company, always. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Elevate Podcast. With thanks to Connect Now. To stay in touch with all things Elite Agent, sign up for our daily newsletter, The Brief, at eliteagent.com slash subscribe.